I'm going to really echo Jurgen's comments. The devil is in the details. So what I'm going to try to do in the next 20 minutes is give you a, a very detailed sense of the kind of questions and issues and design details that you need to think about in designing any basic income or guaranteed income, and then give you a couple, two illustrative examples of, of options for, for Manitoba. Um, uh, so let me, pardon? My, okay. Um, so we have already. Do you want a handheld mic? That might be. So uh, this has already been presented to you in the, in the, the flyer, but the two options are universal demogrant. The example of that currently is the universal child care benefit. It was $1,200 a year for each child under six, regardless of your level of income, and it gets paid for through your, your personal income taxes. Option two is what's been variously called a negative income tax. I refer to it as an income-tested benefit. It's also been referred to as a refundable tax credit. This design is obviously more complex. You have, to, you have a guarantee the, the maximum amount you get in the absence of any other income. There's a turning point at which that income gets to be, starts getting clawed back. The rate at which it gets clawed back is the benefit reduction rate. And then the exit point is the level of income at which the benefit disappears. So the calculation of a net benefit is equal to the guarantee if your income is below the turning point, and if your income is above the turning point, it's the guarantee minus the amount by which your income exceeds the turning point times the benefit reduction rate. An example of an income-tested benefit is the National Child, Child Benefit Supplement. The example for one child, the guarantee is $2,241 a year. You get that amount up to your up to the f level of family income of twenty five thousand five eighty four, beyond which that guarantee is reduced at twelve and a half cents, twelve point two cents per dollar, with the result that the exit point is forty three nine fifty three. That's basically the, the design features of, of any income tested benefit. A, a, a program like the working income tax benefit is a bit more complicated because there's actually a phase-in rate, a plateau, and an exit. But for most of the programs we're talking about, this is the design. So in designing any income-tested benefit, uh, if I, oh, sorry, I'm not very, okay, in designing any income-tested benefit, you, you, as Jurgen said, you have to think about what the guarantee is, what the turning point, benefit reduction rate, is going to be. And those three parameters then define your exit point. How many families in the, in the population will be covered by the benefit and what the total cost would be. Uh, to give you some sense of the trade-offs involved, um, I put together uh, this example. Uh, what's critical about this is they're equal cost options. Um, in doing this, I took advantage of an absolutely incredible modeling package that Stats Canada has developed and implemented for the last 20 years. It's called SPSDM, Social Policy Simulation Database and Model. It's an absolutely incredible piece of intellectual capital because it weds actual income data for about 50,000 Canadian families with every federal and provincial tax and transfer program over the last 20 years. And it projects that out. The most recent data is for 2010, but it incorporates a bunch of uh, growth, growth parameters that allow you to extend that model out to 2015, 2016. So with this model, you can go in and you can create any basic income that you want or any income test to transfer program and the beauty is you can then say, what would the net benefits be for low-income families, middle-income families, high-income families? It's, it's an amazing piece of um, modeling software. And so what I did, and this is an example from Manitoba, I said, I want to model three different programs that cost in total the same amount of money. 
So option one is your standard negative income tax. So in this model, you're offering a guarantee of $3,000. The, the slope of that blue line is the tax back rate, and it happens to be about 12.2%. So you claw that money back starting at the first dollar income out to where the, the benefit disappears at just over $24,000 of income. That's your classic simple model. There is no turning point, or, or the turning point is, is zero dollars. Option two uh, says, well, let's let's extend the guarantee that maximum amount up to and in this case it's sixty one hundred dollars which is about twenty five percent of the the exit point well you see that what you have to do to to stay within the same budget and this this starts to get at the trade-offs you have to claw back the income at a faster rate than the blue line and the 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 slope of that red line happens to be twenty percent so in order to stay within the same budget, if you want to extend maximum benefits to the lowest income families, then to stay within the budget, you have to claw it back faster for the remaining families. One of the trade-offs that you face with that is that the, a higher benefit reduction rate then discourages employment. Uh, and I'll get to that a bit later, but, but there are work disincentive effects to providing people with income. Um, and so your, your work disincentive effects become greater the, the faster, the, the, the higher the rate at which you claw back income. So let's say you want to make the opposite decision and say, well, you know, I'm really kind of more interested in, in keeping that benefit reduction rate low and making it available to more families. So that's option three. But in order to stay within the total, same total budget, then you have to reduce your guarantee to about $2,100 a year. You have the same turning point of $6,100. But what you're then able to do is, is claw that back at a, at a lower rate, which in the green line is, is 11%. And you can see that the exit point then is farther out. So you, more people benefit from partial benefits. Uh, their, their income is taxed back at a lower rate. But the trade-off is that your initial guarantee is lower to stay within the same budget constraint. So this graph is really intended to give you a sense of what those trade-offs are in designing a specific uh, basic income or guaranteed annual income. Uh, there are a whole host of other design considerations that you have to think about in constructing any particular basic income. Most of these have to do with an, an income-tested benefit. Uh, uh, a Democrat, Democrat is a lot easier because it's based on, um, you, you, don't, you don't worry about what the, the definition of income is going to be because everybody gets it and you're, all your, you're recouping the cost just through the personal in, income tax system. But with any income-tested program, you have to think about the definition of income. Is it going to be gross, net, taxable? What, what, uh, what other sources of income might you exclude? Uh, will you include transfer payments, exclude them? Will the income be based on the individual or the family? Um, and as an example of one definition is the, uh, the definition used to uh, calculate the, the net benefits for the National Child Benefit Supplement. That's called the Adjusted Net Family Income. It's uh, CRA's net income of family, based on the family definition, family income, not individual, minus UCCB and um, registered disability savings plans, plus repayments from that. So it's a bit of a complicated definition. But that gives you a sense of how the detail you have to incorporate in your definition of income. Um, definition of the benefit unit. Is it the individual, in the case of the old age security, or the family, in the case of uh, most of the, the child-related uh, transfer programs? The family unit is it's the family level of income that's used in defining the net benefit. One of the things that you can do, though, is 
you, you, one does have the flexibility. You can define income at the family level for defining what the value of the net benefit is, but then you, there's, there's nothing preventing an administration organization from then divvying that up and cutting a check to each individual. So there's, you know, somebody, there's tenants in the basic income uh, tradition that say, no, the individual's got to get the check, not the family. Uh, it's got to be individually defined. Well, y you do have flexibility. Um, you know, you can cut a check to each individual in the family unit, but still base the, the net benefit, the total net benefit on, on the basis of, of family income. Another thing you have to treat it to think about is the treatment of other transfer income. And my sense is that if, if you see a, a GAI, I use the Guaranteed Annual Income acronym here, but it could be basic income. If the GAI is seen as a complement to existing programs, then you should include those other transfer programs in the definition of your income because you, you want to take those into consideration in defining what the, the, the incremental value of your transfer payment is going to be. Conversely, though, if you see the GAI as a replacement, then you want to exclude the full value of those benefits in your definition of family income because those programs aren't going to exist. Um, so those are some design considerations. Others that you have to think about are you going to have a constant or variable guarantee? Um, if it's a family-based benefit, like the National Child Benefit Supplement, um, their guarantee is based on a per-child amount up to three children. So it varies by the number of children in the family unit. Um, I like the idea of having a variable guarantee because that reflects family size, because a family of, of size five is obviously going to have more needs, and their low income threshold is going to be much higher than a family of size one. So one should make the guarantee a function of family size two. And one rule of thumb you can do in, in, in making those adjustments is use the, the low income measure adjustments where it takes the square root of family size to figure out how much families of different size should get. Uh, but some programs only have one guarantee regardless of the size of the family. Um, one, of the, one of the principles to think about in, in trying to design these parameters is what's called horizontal equity. You should, and the notion of horizontal equity is that you should be treating different families in different circumstances the same way. And so how it would get uh, spelled out in detail is if a family, if a person is disabled, then you might uh, reduce the amount, uh, the gross income that you use for defining the net benefit by the value of their disability payments that they have to make to, you know, uh, support services. Because then what you're saying is, this family has special needs that really reduce the amount of disposable income available to it. So that's, that's one, and, and, and another example would be the use of, of net income rather than gross income because the Revenue Canada allows deductions for employment related expenses. Uh, so a net income might do a better job of establishing horizontal equity across families than, than the gross income definition because it recognizes that families that work in some ways don't have the same level of disposable income as other families because they have to pay compulsory payroll deductions, et cetera. So I offer that as a, as a way of thinking about how to define income and how to think about what the guarantee should be, is, is, is making decisions that try to uh, create horizontal equity across the, the variety of families that, that would be eligible for the benefit. Um, same thing with the be benefit reduction rate. Many programs have variable benefit reductions rates, such as the NCBS, the Manitoba Child Benefit, that conditioned on family size. Well, I would argue this basically imposes higher BRRs on larger families with no clear rationale except to constrain the exit level. You, you want to contain costs. Well, th that doesn't make sense to me because it really creates inequities across the families. 
So for, for me, a, a constant benefit reduction rate makes more sense because benefit reduction rates do affect work incentives. Delivery platform is, is really important to think about it. Most of the federal programs are run through the tax system. The advantage of that is virtually everybody files an income tax these days, so you don't have to worry about take up. You know, uh, take up is almost 100%. And it's extremely efficient to administer. Uh, OAS admin costs are 0.4% of the total payouts. Welfare, 25%. So, you know, having a, a, a delivery system that minimizes admin costs is, is, a, is a really critical consideration and also the coverage of the eligible population. And by, by comparison, uh, you know, other programs where you have to enroll, like the Manitoba Child Benefit, I've estimated the take up for the Manitoba Child Benefit to be around 35 or 40 percent. It was a comment made earlier. For whatever reason, people that are eligible don't bother enrolling in the program. Well, if your objective is, is coverage, then you don't want to, you really want to select that delivery platform that min, admi, minimizes admin costs and achieves ma maximum coverage. Uh, so those are other design considerations. Uh, so now for some examples. This is uh, a proposal that, uh, I wish I could remember his last name, an economist from Queens, Rob and somebody, uh, put forth uh, a couple of years ago. He said, basically, why not, uh, he, he appeared before a Senate committee in, on uh, income inequality, I think. So he said, why not, why not take the non-refundable tax credits that are currently offered by the personal tax system and convert them into refundable tax credits? Non-refundable tax credits are only used to reduce your tax payable. Well, if you have no tax payable, you don't, you don't get the advantage of, of that. So his suggestion was convert them in, into refundable tax credits. So Wayne Simpson and I have been doing some work using the SPSDM model to, to model this at the, at the federal level. So I, I put together an example of what such a program would work uh, at, at the provincial level. So the average guarantee is the total value of the non-refundable tax. How's my time? Oh, okay. Uh, just very quickly, you see that the average guarantee varies because by family size, the, the number of refundable, non-refundable tax credits people would get would vary. I've set the turning point being 25% of the exit, a variable benefit reduction rate so that the exit level is the LICO, the before tax LICO, which of course varies by family size. So what would be the cost and impact of this version of a guaranteed income? See, one of my basic message is that there's an infinite number of different guaranteed incomes that you can design, an absolutely infinite number. So you have to make choices. So this is just one example. Um, so what would the cost be? $117 million per year for Manitoba, 173,000 recipients, 19% of all adults. In this example, I, and this is the other nice thing about SBSDM, then you can figure out how you're gonna pay for it. So in order to pay for it, and this is just one, one method of doing it, so I, I figured out that I would have to increase the provincial income tax brackets by 2.9% each bracket from 10.8 to 11.1, .1, et cetera, to, to raise that additional 117 million. So what would the impact be? All adults, the pre-tax RTC would be 674. You take away the uh, additional income you raise through taxes to pay for it, only drops to 661. But then you factor in the labor supply effects of getting that money, it drops to 534. And that's the labor supply effect. And I can talk later about how I calculated the labor supply effects. Low income, they get more, not low income less. Uh, impact on poverty. This is the other nice thing about SBSDM. You can then look at its impacts on rate and, and depth of poverty. So you get a 6.5% decline in the poverty rate and 11% decline in the depth of poverty. Um, so that's one example. Second example is a bit more ambitious. This one tries to replace 
Um, Sorry. This one tries to replace social assistance benefits. So I set the guarantee for the single person at just above what the 2014 total, total needs budget for a single employable is, and then I used the limb equivalent scale to, grow, to crank up the guarantee by other family sizes. I set the turning point at $2,500, which is just a bit above what the current social assistance program allows people to keep before it starts clawing it back. I was able to get a benefit reduction rate of 25%, which is substantially lower than the 70% benefit reduction rate that the current SA program applies to earned income, such that, and I chose the benefit reduction rate such that the exit point is one and a half times the LICO, which I think, I don't remember which LICO I used. There's either the before or after tax LICO. So that, that's the design of this, of this program. Um, so what would, it, what would it cost and what would the impacts be? Gross cost would be $727 million a year, but if you're able to replace wealth, social assistance, the rent assist, and the Manitoba Child Benefit programs, then your net cost would be about $351 million a year. And that net cost also excludes any longer term savings from reducing the number of people you have to pay to run the social assistance program. So if you were able to replace most of them over time, then those savings would be greater. But initially, the net cost would be that much. It would cover 163,000 families, 36% of it all. And this is focused just on the non-elderly because that social assistance doesn't really cover the elderly population. So I restricted this model to just the non-elderly. Uh, and at, at the benefit levels that we're talking about, most of the elderly wouldn't qualify for any benefits because they're already getting more in OAS and GIS than would be offered by this program. This program to finance would require a 10% increase in the provincial income tax brackets. The average impacts would be as follows. Uh, Pre-tax GI for all the adults would be 53 you reduce it by the extra tax they pay, it's only 51, but then you take into account the labor supply effects. The net benefit would be $3,400. It would have the effect of reducing labor earnings by 8.4%. Big impact on poverty though. You get a 33% reduction in the poverty rate. You get a 41% reduction in the depth of poverty. Uh, so pretty significant impacts. Uh, so for $351 million a year. Um, conclusions, designing an income tested benefit always involves trade-offs between generosity, population coverage, cost, work incentive effects. Higher the guarantee, the greater population coverage and cost at a given benefit reduction rate. Same guarantee constraining the cost involves increasing the benefit reduction rate which increases the work disincentive effects. Achieving horizontal equity requires acknowledging that different sized families require different guarantees and exit levels, allowing for deductions from gross income helps with that. Determining the value of the final net benefit of GAI requires taking into account the effect of raising revenues required to pay for it and the work disincentive effects incurred by it. The devil and God are in the details. The one, you know, I've, uh, I've just looked at those costs, but reflecting uh, Evelyn's comments. The savings would be eliminating existing programs and the staffing required to administer them. If you can, if you can design a, a, a more efficient way of delivering benefits, then you're gonna save money there. Those savings wouldn't be immediate though because these staff would have to be really employed and you'd only save it as people retire. But then the other savings are any Benefits that accrue from reduced health care costs, criminal justice costs, which I don't think anybody in Canada really has a good handle on that. So those, those savings are, and Evelyn's suggestion would be the savings wouldn't be sufficient to pay for the program. There would be something less. So the, the net cost would be, would be probably less than what I've shown there.
Thanks, Harvey. I, I love this, and I love the SPSDM, and I'm, I'm really glad you're doing this kind of work because it's, um, it's thankless work in a, in a sense. You get stuck in all the details of, of these different kinds of programs, and it's enough to make your head explode after a while. I've been playing with that model a little bit myself at the federal level, and I've got some sort of big ballpark kinds of figures that might make it helpful for um, for people to think about. Um, one of the things that we were looking at, we, we decided when we looked at it that most Canadian benefits, like the child tax benefit, are based on families rather than individuals. So we focused on families, then we set aside people over age 60 thinking that, okay, the OAS and the GIS can deal with that population. We struggled a lot with families where the family head is between 18 and 25. And we struggled with that because many of us have children between 18 and 25. And we thought that maybe a more directive program might be appropriate for some of those people. But we, we did it both ways. But um, we, we sort of sketched out the total cost for Canada of a bunch of different options. Um, and I just want to, if you guaranteed every family in Canada the full LICO, you took all the existing programs and you kept them in place, nobody should be worse off. You top people up to the LICO. So for a one-person family, that would top them up to $23,647 a year. For a two-person family, $29,440 a year. You keep in the tax system in place. For families larger than two people, they get the child tax benefit. So I didn't increase the basic guarantee. I let them keep the child tax benefit. And I asked, how much would that cost if we um, included all families where the family head was between 20, or the oldest person in the family was between 25 and 60? And I came up with $16.2 billion, which sounds like a tremendous amount of money. And then I remembered that the GST, um, each point on the GST is worth $7 billion. My um, estimate of the savings in healthcare alone, hospitalization alone, is about $4 billion which sort of pays for that. If I include all families, including the 18 to 25 year olds, it comes out to $18.6 billion. Remember, this is a top up, so we're keeping all existing programs in place. So these, these numbers are not inconceivable. I mean, it's, it's, it's possible to think of a guaranteed income based on negative income tax principles or refundable tax credits that's actually conceivable and payable. Um, is it something we want to do? That's, that's a different kind of a question um, to ask. So I, I wonder if, if those numbers seem reasonable to you. Does that strike you as the same kinds of numbers you've been getting? Um, I did very different modeling. So no, they're not, you know, I, I didn't, uh, no, I, I got much, much higher numbers than that. So I'd have to go back and look at, at the differences in the modeling. You know, I tried to model a guaranteed annual income for Canada at about $10,000 per person. I think I've used family income as the basis, and I got a gross cost of around 70 or $80 billion. So that's um, well, in order to get that benefit, I basically said your guarantee is 10. I claw that back for each dollar of your your total income, including transfer payments. So I was counting transfer payments in, in, in the income that I used to claw back that, that initial guarantee. Um, and then I looked at how much could be saved by that program then replacing those others and reduce the gross cost that way. So it was, it was a different approach and I got much higher numbers. So the devil is in the details. <laughs> Pardon? And the deity. <laughs> the deity, that's right.
Mm, I'm just trying to think of what I did. Um, well, I kind of reflected on that part because I said, if you, so I, 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 I reduced their guarantee by uh, something like total income. Um, and then I said, how much additional tax would all of these families have to pay to finance it? So I kind of taxed back, in my examples, I taxed back some of that net benefit by the additional amount with, that would have to be raised to finance it. So I, I taxed it back in that way. I didn't, um, yeah, I didn't, I didn't then include in that model I'd have to think about it. That, that's, uh, that's the way I handled that, is I didn't declare it, I guess, technically. I'm, I'm just thinking of the modeling that I did. Um, I didn't declare that as then taxable income. Um, but, but I did then tax away part of that benefit to pay for it. So that's how I handled it in the modeling. Um, I don't have a good answer for that. It was just the way I conceptualized the modeling exercise. It's, okay. I was trying to, I was trying to, I was trying to use the rules of of uh, income tested benefit by saying this. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. When I when I tried to figure out how to pay for it, um, I used the original income of the family unit uh, as the basis for that. So, yeah, I, it was just one of those details that I overlooked in terms of doing the modeling. No, 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 I mean, okay. that's, a, again, yeah, that's a design decision. Are you gonna treat it as taxable income or not? Yeah. Okay. Uh, for me, it would be trying to get at the uh, effect of a, a guaranteed income on investments. The American experiments only looked, except for the few exceptions, basically looked at the impact on employment. That was their primary interest, labor supply effects. But you can conceive of a whole range of different effects. And none of that was really studied rigorously by any of those experiments. Um, and yet that's a big question in terms of, I think it's political saleability is, I mean, if, if, if a basic income turns out to have quite substantial savings on the uh, health side, on the criminal justice side, then knowing that would really help make the case for a basic income in Canada, but we don't know that. So for me, that would be a priority for a research strategy. But having said that, I also, I think the question is for, let's say you wanna spend $300 million a year in Manitoba on providing a basic income. If I was in the government, I would ask, well, what else could I spend $300 million on and would it give me a bigger bang for the buck? And that, that is always the question. I mean, it's an opportunity cost. So is, is a basic income the, the wisest investment to make, or are there better investments to make, depending on what your policy objective is, be it reduction of poverty, whatever. So th those are the two comments I would have on that. Evelyn? Thank you. As someone who spends most of her life writing research grants, I can answer that real quick. <laughs> I, I actually, though, before I, I get to that, I, 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 wanna, I wanna try to reframe things we've been talking about a little bit when we talk about cost. I work in a medical faculty. When we buy a gamma knife or a giant machine that we put down in cancer care, nobody says, will this pay for itself, you know? We say, look at the improvements in quality of life. We're improving the health of all Manitobans. Why aren't we saying the same thing about guaranteed income? Why does it have to pay for itself? Why does it have to be revenue neutral? If we can improve the lives of kids, if we can improve the lives of families, if we can make Canadians better off, 
Why should it pay for itself? We don't do that with other kinds of investments. We're getting something for it. But in terms of the research agenda, given an infinite resources and infinite time and infinite personnel, I would love to redo this Mincom experiment, to redo it in different jurisdictions, um, to do it over a period of maybe four years, and to take advantage of the things that we have now that we didn't have in the 1970s. When you guys were doing this experiment in the 1970s, this kind of data collection was, I mean, you were pioneering it. And right now, we've got databases that nobody can imagine. I talked to you a little bit about the health database, but the, the aspects of the health database I could use were really limited because that was all that was collected in the 1970s. Right now, that's tied into all the social assistance data, all the education data in Manitoba, so I can follow those kids. I, I know if there's a kid in a family receiving the equivalent of income. I know whether that, cat, that kid's doing on his standardized exams. I know whether he's attending class. I know how often he's moving around the province, whether he's going from one city to another and changing schools. I know whether he was admitted to Red River College, whether he graduated. Um, I, you know, we've got virtually everything. If we could only link it into the tax database and the employment database, I'd know everything about these people. So, I mean, we can do things now. And, if we add those data advantages, and it's way cheaper, I got to tell you, than it used to be to do this kind of research because that data is routinely collected. We've also made advances in statistics since the 1970s. We can do things now that we couldn't do in the 1970s. So if we could do a pilot project now, if we only had the imagination to say, okay, maybe now is not the right time. I'm not sure I believe that, but maybe it isn't. Five years from now, let's talk about then. In the meantime, Let's choose four or five communities across Canada. Let's see how this works on a reserve. Let's see how this works in a city like Winnipeg. Let's see how it works in a city like Toronto where we've got a huge immigrant population. Let's see what the effect is on employment, on investment, on volunteer work in the community, on caregiving, on family interaction. I mean, we know it's just an opportunity you can't even imagine as a social scientist to do that. Thanks. <laughs>